All right, it looks like we should be live, Victor. Are we live? We're live. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Jason. Uh, hi, thanks for having me on uh, on this stream. I'm really, really excited to uh, dig in and do some experimenting here. So uh, I think most of the people here, I'm pretty sure know who I am since they know my stream. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Well, um, I've been uh, I've been around the block uh, programming C plus plus for uh, almost twenty years now, and um, oh, you're old. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I really enjoy um, participating in the C plus plus community and interacting with people uh, at conferences and on Twitter. And we have I think we have a very uh, solid and um, very uh, enthusiastic community and um, mostly welcoming uh, a bunch of people. And I, I, I really love um, sharing ideas and debating uh, various points uh, over the uh, social channels at, at, and at conferences. And I, I really, really, really miss uh, the physical part of actually being on site and chatting on the hallways or over beer after a long conference day with uh, uh, similar folks and uh, debate stuff we've heard uh, during the daytime sessions and maybe share a bit of uh, uh, a bit of our uh, scars or <laughs> uh, work experiences so i'm really enthusiastic to be uh, able to join you today and uh, maybe investigate some of the stuff we've heard uh, uh, maybe stuff we've seen in uh, code reviews at work or in uh, open source projects that we uh, work on uh, stuff we've heard um, interacting with colleagues, um, uh, stuff we've heard uh, when onboarding uh, junior developers or uh, when um, uh, mentoring uh, interns at work and um, in the guidance that uh, sometimes uh, we need to offer them and uh, explanations on rationales and uh, good practices that we, we try to uh, keep up uh, within our teams. So. Maybe this is a nice opportunity to role play here and uh, go through so, through some of the um, items that we've picked up over the time. Uh, I do have a list, but um, I'm very um, curious to, to see if we have uh, suggestions from the audience. Uh, do feel free to use the live chat and uh, propose um, topics that uh, we can experiment on. This is totally improvised, and I'm sure Jason is is loving this. Uh, he's very much an improv uh, kind of person, and uh, I, I think he's going to thrive on uh, the surprise element. And uh, we actually didn't prepare for this uh, too much, uh, and uh, we're, we're hoping to um, give this um, interaction an opportunity to go um, either direction. And so we're very flexible in taking this um, um, these ideas and you know, experiment and see where where it takes us, and what conclusions do we do we draw? Do we confirm some of the myths? Do we um, disprove them uh, and see um, what we discover? And you said we didn't prepare very much, but I, I want to be fair here. You do have a list of like 150 different <laughs> myths that you have personally <laughs> encountered. Yeah, and I consider that underprepared. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Our, uh, so I do have a list, but uh, I'm happy to to take uh, suggestions from the audience. Okay, so uh, someone, I, I have, there's a couple of comments here. I just want to address real quick since we're getting started. Still, uh, well, first of all, I just want to comment that this X Split VCam here. That's because I'm using the trial version of X Split VCam right now, and I wanted to see what it would be like to dynamically erase my background. So that's that's what that is. Um, someone is asking where you're from, Victor. Oh, I am uh, I'm from Romania. All right. And um, I'm currently located there. <laughs> and you're currently located there. Yeah, under lockdown in, in my home. Uh, right. Um, someone is asking why is only 720p available? I am using StreamYard for the first time ever. And let's just say it was a little bit of a mistake on my part that uh, 720p is the only thing available here. But hopefully, the resolution is still good enough. I'm going to, um, I think it should be, but I will be sure to zoom the UI as necessary. Please comment if you've got any problems with viewing it. And our friends at Copper Spice have recommended a beer in the hallway. So 
<laughs> yeah. I support that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. And I guess I should probably introduce myself. I, I gave Victor a hard time for saying he's been programming in C++ for 20 years. It's also been approximately 20 years since I started programming in C++ professionally, uh, a little bit less than that for professional C++ experience. Uh, but I first used C++ in 1996. Oh. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's maybe perhaps worth just mentioning for those of you who don't speak at conferences and this kind of thing. And Victor said, I thrive on the improv aspect here. I just, I, I, I very rarely talk about this publicly, but I, the very first time I ever had to speak in a professional setting, I got back to the manager of that group that I was working for afterward. And I said, I am never doing this ever again, just so you know. <laughs> and <laughs> they never asked me to do anything like that again. And then ended up uh, six years later, I decided to just jump in head first into these things. And now I've been doing some kind of streaming or podcasting or conference speaking for what, six years now? It doesn't, almost doesn't even seem believable. It's hard to imagine a, a time before C++ waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, so how do we want to get started with this, Victor? So um, uh, as I said, I, I think um, we uh, we have a, a pretty good uh, starting list, and I, I'll I'll try to pick up um, a, a good starting point um, for our discussion. So I, I thought about maybe uh, starting with a, a a thing that I I've seen a couple of times um, um, uh, even at work, and I, I I've definitely have had discussions with people around this um, people and. Uh, standard regex and doing uh, manual string manipulations and people being uh, so put off by uh, standard regex and uh, its notorious uh, performance reputation. <laughs> uh, and uh, many people do prefer uh, manual string manipulations, uh, doing uh, uh, find first off substring operations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. to uh, extract patterns from uh, an input string. And uh, part of it is uh, regular expression grammar in general is not something everybody's a fan of. Uh, I, I must admit, uh, for me, regular expressions, like writing regular expressions is, is a, always a pain. Mm -hmm. And I, I can never uh, <laughs> go back and edit. I have to I will always start from scratch. <laughs> Regex is a, re a write-only language. For yeah, you. it's a write-only language for me. It's definitely uh, alien for me. And um, even people that are very comfortable uh, uh, coming up with the, the grammar uh, needed to, to express the pattern they need to match and or extract uh, have a, a reluctance to, to actually reach out to, to use uh, standard Regex or any other Regex library for that matter. So maybe we can start with something around this okay let's so, take on this uh how do we want to look at this do we want to look at like a complicated string matching thing or do we just want to look at like a begins with kind of thing or um maybe maybe we can um match for example like um let uh, let's think about matching uh, like uh, a config file, like uh, a property, like uh, key value, key equals value in a line, okay. in a string line, something like that. How, how do you think? How do you think about that? I have so, so I just noticed people are commenting match Roman numerals. Well, oh. <laughs> it's a bit sadistic, but okay. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, matching Roman numeral is pretty easy, right? It would just be any set. Uh, well, unless you wanted to verify that it was a correct. Exactly. Roman if you want to enforce the, the correct placement of, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, so uh, I'll, I'll start with, well, OK, so I, I've just included regex, and I've got my compiler explorer window output here. Uh, am I the only? Oh, I'm sorry, I just glanced over. Um, it's my habit because of my streaming that I see out of the corner of my eye over here on the right side of me. The um, people the, are suggesting uh, Regex 101, and uh, they, they, uh, for that matter, there are several websites that actually help you debug uh, your Regex and see uh, visually how you match uh, different patterns. Uh, those help a lot. 
especially for people like, like me that are not comfortable just uh, pouring out uh, <laughs> the regex. <laughs> I'm I so let's see compilation failed uh oh because I'm missing a uh so I'm just gonna start with a regular expression that does nothing this is just a regular an empty match regular expression and I just want to because this does actually get on my nerves personally um <laughs> do, do we see it's compiling it's compiling it's, it's still compiling. It's still compiling. <laughs> we haven't actually done anything yet. We just created a regex object. Oh, I mean, sorry, I was still compiling the last one. Okay. This uh, is the the most expensive part of of the of the regex stuff. Oh, see, just... processing time exceeded. So we're gonna have to ring up Matt because we can't actually use standard regex in compiler oh. explorer. Well, do you, do you have your uh, oh, local instance installed? Or... I do. I do have. Well, no. It would it would be a bad idea for me to spin up my local. Well, actually, I might well, be able to do that. Well, Matt, I see Matt in the chat, so maybe. <laughs> maybe <laughs> yeah, Matt just commented there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to what the. Okay. So you wanted to do something like, uh, let's see, a. A key value pair or something. A like non breaking that. set of characters for however many of them uh, equals to some other non breaking set of characters, perhaps. They should match on something like um, x equals five, something like that. Uh, whoa, I typed Z and I said X. Something typing like my that. entire something life. Like that. Maybe with some um, optional spaces around it. How does that sound? Yep. OK. And maybe maybe, uh, um, maybe we can allow for a white space around the equal sign. Yeah, that's what I just did, white space around the equal sign. OK, OK. Oh, yeah. oops, I have to double escape these. OK, so let's just start. Uh, I'm gonna yes, rostering literals. Thank you, Leslie. I was just gonna say that yeah. as well. As long as we're doing this, we may as well use rostering literals. And, yeah, um, I love this. <laughs> I always get the order wrong the first time I type it, and then I have to go back in and edit it again. Mm -hmm. it happens every time. All right, so this rostering literal. For those of you who don't know that, this section inside of here is literal going into the code. Uh, so I could even have new lines in the middle of this, and they would become part of the string, literal, literally. Part of the string literal. Yep. Okay. So, um, and then we, how does this work? We want to do a. Uh, Let's ex extract the parts now. Extract the parts. Okay. So I need to put a grouping sub expression in here. To be like this. I can never remember if they're escaped or not in this version of regex. Well, I can't help you there. All right, so we want to do should be we should be able to give a, a string literal. Let's just go ahead and try our our exact our example here. And I I have to be honest, I have to look up like every time what the order of these parameters are. I think that's correct. Yeah, that's about the same for me. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do that. What was that? Sorry. CBP reference is your friend. Yeah, CBP reference is always your friend. S match. Does a commenter. Uh, because regex match is. Oh, no, regex match. Oh, right. You have to take the match results and put it in, and then the regex and the Ross and the character literal. OK. So. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm actually looking at the stream while trying to type instead of looking at my own desktop in front of me. And that seems to be, I seem to keep getting my hands off of the home keys.
Uh, someone asked what myth is being ex uh, busted here. Uh, well, uh, first of all, we, we should see uh, if the performance of such a, a matcher is actually acceptable for the simple thing that we're trying to do here. For example, in, imagine we're trying to uh, parse a config file. Is it acceptable for something like uh, parsing a, a fairly simple grammar config file? Is it acceptable to use regex for a scenario like that, performance-wise? I don't know how, what are people's feelings around that. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Smash. That was what someone was just commenting. We're looking at this uh, smatch type def here so that we know what type to pass into it. Oh, seriously. I actually do find standard regex to be a giant pain to use. I have to be perfectly honest. I really do. So, so I see. <laughs> I already have a, a an angry user. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'm all in the camp of uh, uh, actually going for uh, manual string manipulations when when things are pretty straightforward. So, because I... actually navigating this API seems more like a pain than a win. <laughs> yeah. So I am. Uh, passing in a raw string literal, character string literal, and uh, my match results should be the one that takes a character pointer, and I'm using s match, which is the one that takes a basic string, which means that it wants the thing that I'm passing into it to be a basic string. So let's just go ahead and roll with that, I guess. The wonders of the overload set. And then it takes so incredibly long to compile. I uh, The state machine is the most expensive part, I guess, the constructor. I don't know. Here's a deleted function. All right, what am I getting wrong now, people? They tell me. C match is a string literal. Yeah, C match, but then I'm taking in so. I already see some comments, and I wanted to address this uh, about uh, CTRE, uh, Hana Dusikova's uh, library for compile time regular expressions. So uh, definitely uh, a, a completely uh, different way to <laughs> to handle this. Oh. And in my opinion, a much cleaner API. Oh, yes. I, I, I am strongly of the opinion of using HANA CTRE if you can. In fact, I'm using yeah. it in a project that I'm currently working on. Uh, so I was passing in a string temporary, and it can't return the results back in a match sub uh, expression to a temporary, because then it would be violating uh, lifetime issues. So it was an explicitly deleted regex match overload in the case that the first parameter was a, a standard uh, string um, R value. And I have an unused variable. OK. Yeah. Uh, we already have a, a fairly famous quote uh, in the chat. Some people, when right. confronted with the problem, think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. Now I have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I've seen that a couple of times. I am not familiar with that one. Oh, this is not going to actually this is going to give me iterators. And so it just becomes levels of difficulty to deal with. So yeah, and now I'm not like. So uh, we, we are uh, like 10 minutes in into this example, and we're already experiencing some pain for fairly simple <laughs> trivial operation that we need to perform, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't even get this compiling. Let's just see if we actually matched, OK? Let's just see if we matched. And then we'll, we'll run this and. Uh, Where'd my other window go, Matt? There it is. I just blame Matt randomly when something doesn't work. Matt just commented that uh, the old uh, Compiler Explorer instances are running, are humming fine. So maybe GCC is the problem, taking too much to compile. Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. definitely GCC's problem. I'm not actually going to give Matt a hard time. OK, <laughs> so uh, yeah, is, is this 
Is is it a myth that regex is hard to use? Um, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> That's standard <laughs> regex. Standard regex. Standard regex. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we set ourselves a, a fairly trivial task here. So um, failing to to parse such a simple uh, such a simple construct in in uh, in a few minutes, I think, is quite telling on the, the I don't know the shape of the this API. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, not taking into account the the time it takes to compile stuff like that, <laughs> and the runtime performance because I I, I honestly I couldn't see myself uh, implementing a, a config parser for something as simple as this like a key value pairs uh, using standard regex I I could I I would consider this performance uh, unacceptable I, runtime I, performance yeah and there's there's a lot of little gotchas here if you accidentally create your regex inside of your loop, for example. <laughs> yeah. Bam, you're, then, you're then like... Because you're, yeah. you're rebuilding the whole state machine every time. <laughs> and interestingly, the actual results object itself is surprisingly expensive to create. You probably want to create that outside of your match loop also. I didn't know, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's just it's little things that I would normally say never do this, I'm like, well, sorry, you're using standard regex, you, you have to do this now. Like, limit the scope of variables as much as possible. With regex, no. Like, explode the scope of variables as much as possible. <laughs> it's... Yeah. So... Oh, wait, so we actually did get a match on our sub-expressions here, just for the record. Um, oh, do, do we have output? Uh, no, because I, I couldn't get the syntax right for uh, actually accessing the things contained in the regex match. Um, yeah, so the, the pain continues. Yeah, so first and second. Uh, I'm going to do this. I think that is correct. I'm going to create a new string just so that I have a way to output it. Uh, this would not be the ideal thing to do, but I'm going to create it with the iterator pair that is returned from the match. And I think I did that correct, although we'll see if someone on the channel is going to give me a uh, on the time. chat. Uh, my my viewers are really helpful, actually, when I'm doing a live stream. It's often that they tell me, hey, you missed that semicolon or whatever. So it's actually, uh, I rely on them when I'm trying to do programming. Is Victor on here? We could take a moment to think. The other Victor, that is, not yeah. you. The, the, MP, the FMT Victor. <laughs> yes, the lib format Victor. Well, that's going to be a breath of fresh air as soon as we have it in, in actual uh, uh, production compilers and libraries. <laughs> I feel like the, the myth that you set out to say here is that standard regex is too slow uh, for production use. And um, I feel in, like for simple things, I think it's 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 not worth it <laughs> for little things. Yeah. yeah, but we do have a great option in CTRE. CTRE's yeah. code is definitely it, it compiles ten times faster than this, I believe. And um, I, and I think uh, a very important uh, factor here is the the API. I think the API is much more intuitive for CTRE. Yes. So, um, because it's been updated yeah. to work with things like string views, which standard regex doesn't actually have support for string views yet. Yeah. Um, and CTRE can compile your regular expressions at compile time. That's much better than compiling your regular expressions at runtime, which is effectively what this does. Actually, it doesn't even compile them at runtime. Um, I've looked into this. Uh, are, are you familiar with this, Victor? I think maybe we move yeah. on to something else in a moment here. But are you referring to the way it constructs the state machine in the, in yes. the regex constructor? 
but there's a flag that you can pack to the regex con con the regex constructor saying, please optimize this regular expression. So it does more work at construction time. And as well, far as I can tell, all of the implementations of standard regex uh, have that defined as a no-op. You can pass the optimize flag, but it does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's hopeless. No, and I didn't know. I didn't know about it. We can't actually ex execute this. Uh, so yeah. Okay. I think, we, I, I think we've spent all our uh, uh, running time on uh, Compiler Explorer just building the. the we have. <laughs> Let's move on to something that isn't quite so slow to compile. Maybe we yeah, can yeah. I have I have a I, I have a good follow up, and it's a, it's a thing I I've heard. Uh, you know, Wait, do I need to leave this regex code up here or not? Uh, no, I think okay. we, I think we can agree that that was not our best moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Under regex, man. Yeah. Um, I, I it's a thing I I've heard. Um, early on, um, at, uh, when people started embracing uh, using uh, STL uh, about ab abstraction penalty and dereferencing uh, iterators, and um, to be fair, early implementations of the standard library were not very optimal in this regard, and compilers couldn't see through the the uh, iterator indirections. And um, yeah, I think people remember. Uh, dereferencing uh, iterators and taking the address of <laughs> of the stuff inside so you you have to avoid stuff like that so uh, i do have um, yeah awkward memories from that time uh, and i've seen similar comments uh, nowadays with standard optional and uh, people thinking that uh, standard optional uh, is actually a, a bloat and it's um, not worthwhile um, expressing optional values in terms of uh, optional of T, and uh, the fact that we can um, do away with just using um, uh, pointers and expressing you know, not a value via like a null pointer. And I've seen uh, comments uh, along the lines of uh, standard optional uh, basically producing code bloat and difficulty in understanding and uh, complicating APIs and uh, being uh, basically um, as a vocabulary type in your API is basically propagating itself throughout uh, APIs that need to be chained together. And maybe we can uh, do a tangent here and talk about um, con uh, monadic continuations for optionals and optional chaining maybe uh, if we have a, a good example here. Okay. So let, let's let's start out by just examining what, what happens if we we use optional to, to model not a value instead of a pointer here. OK, so um, we're just going to try, let's see. Uh, there's several different ways to approach this kind of example. I'm, I'm going to start here. But what I'm doing is I'm just creating a value, an unknown value. I'm using main for it. Uh, Actually, no, let's let's not use main. Let's use a different function. Uh, I'm going to do this. And this. Uh, I'm. I'm naming these things maybe in a way that I quite wouldn't normally, just so that we have code that we can talk about more easily. Sure. Uh, while you build up your example there, uh, I'm just going to pick up on some of the comments in the, in the chat. Um, uh, I mentioned briefly earlier about uh, uh, monadic uh, optional and chaining. And uh, our friend Bjorn mentioned uh, uh, Cybrand's um, uh, optional implementation that is excellent. Uh, you can find it uh, open source um, on their GitHub. Uh, I think it's uh, it, it, the namespace is like uh, TL uh, optional for tar Tartan Lama. <laughs> so oh. you can properly search for that. 
uh, if uh, people are interested and people are uh, also asking about um, expected and this is this has been a controversial uh, um, library facility in uh, i know in the in the um, uh, standards committee and it's, i think it's been a while uh, in in the in the making maybe we're we're going to see some incarnation of that soon <laughs> And I so is it null opt t? I think that's right for expressing explicitly that you want an empty optional as an option. Or I could just return this. I think you can, you can also yeah yeah that that would probably work. This in, this introduces a point of confusion. Am I returning a default constructed optional, or am I returning a default constructed string? Now, I know that I'm returning a default constructed optional because that is the return type of this function. Yep. Um, but that takes a little bit extra. Yeah, and it's, it's, I think the, the point of confusion here is that it's not symmetrical. Uh, the both branches um, are, are not symmetrical, like line 12 and line 14. You expect to see. Uh, similar things, so maybe that's the the confusion part. Yeah, maybe people are uh, confusing that with an empty string there. So uh, I think a null opt would be more verbose but clearer. Null opt, it's null opt. Is null opt a static instantiation of null opt t? I think so. Yeah, return. Yeah, that's the same. So people on the yeah, okay. So there we are. Uh, this is the same code. Now I made a couple of very explicit decisions here. One is the method in which I am returning the string, and the other is the size of the string. So this code is not intentionally not doing any dynamic allocation because the string is a small string. It's going to fit in the small string optimization of every standard library implementation that exists today. And we can see, like, if you've been around enough, um, I'll ask Matt, but. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is hello world in hex. <laughs> well, he would know. <laughs> Actually, it's not fully. We have to get the last couple of values here. And then uh, it's returning um, the 11 as the size that's coming in here in this part of the pointer. All right, so the get optional string, interestingly, now the compiler, what it saw like all the way through this, right? Get, uh, get optional string size doesn't even call get optional value at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it amazing. It says if the thing that was passed in is true. It just short whatever. circuits, yeah. Yeah, short circuits, returns 11, or it returns, um, I guess, negative one, right? Because I'm doing in pause here. So I'm doing the the... That's the max value. It's max size t is what in pause is going to be defined as. Yeah, if you don't follow Matt on Twitter, go follow Matt on Twitter. It's Matt, at Matt Godbolt. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, somebody asked the, in chat, uh, what does uh, null opt return? So maybe we should clarify that. OK, so what does null opt return? There is a, uh, there we go. What do I do here? <laughs> We have a funny comment. Standard that... optional is just Rust propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I must say, uh, I've been playing around with uh, with Rust uh, uh, past December's, and uh, it, it was quite pleasant. And uh, I think uh, optional is at the very heart of uh, the type system in, in Rust. So it's basically everything is being built around uh, optional and optional chaining, and um, it's very refreshing to see uh, this kind of programming and kind of um, rewires your brain a bit, uh, composing functions like this and uh, doing transformations behind uh, doing basically F mapping and doing transformations behind the optional inside, basically changing the, the state inside the box. What is uh, size? Uh, TL. Um, yeah, TL go. optional, TL optional. Yeah. TL optional, okay. That's one. And Bjorn also mentioned uh, uh, expect. 
Right. So yeah. this this monadic interface that you're talking about, it's yeah. like I get a that's that's a godsend. It's amazing. <laughs> I we really wish for something like this in, in the standard. And then or else. So I could do something like uh, optional. And then whatever. This is where I start to get actually personally uh, lost in using monadic interfaces because I'm like, okay, and then I want to return the size, whatever. Yeah. But I, I, think, I can't, right? Uh, I, I think you. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you change stuff like this with and then and then and then, you basically build up a staircase and it's fairly difficult to, to see because it's, it's, it no longer looks linear. Right. Uh, and I think what you want is like a do notation in Haskell. <laughs> so, so you can make it like, uh, look like a sequential code. Um, and unfortunately we don't have the syntactic sugar for this, but, um, maybe something uh, along the lines with, um, maybe something similar with the pipe operator that we have for ranges. Um, I'm, I might see uh, something like that uh, chaining, like with maybe a, a pipe operator or an optionals. That could look interesting. I don't know. So, but we're talking something kind of approximating something like this. Those would likely be lambdas, not uh, not. We can't put statements inside of function calls, but we can put lambdas inside expressions, of expressions. Expressions, basically, yeah. We can't put it right, right. So maybe something like that, but we don't have that. We have what we have today. And so we end up with this if uh, if and else all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess as far as does this add code bloat, we can see examples where clearly the compiler sees all the way through. So and it, it definitely, it, it doesn't stand, uh, the, the myth doesn't stand on the, part of being uh, inefficient. It definitely doesn't produce code bloat and cl clearly compilers can see right through this. Uh, the, the, the only part that I think remains to be examined is whether or not uh, people actually like seeing a uh, standard optional um, um, throughout their APIs, like uh, older functions taking optionals as arguments, returning optional values and basically chaining up uh, a several uh, API calls, several, several uh, method calls. And basically this is like, uh, it propagates just like const propagates. So you, you have to change your whole API. And I've, I've heard uh, complaints along the lines that if I want this method to return an optional, then I have to change a whole lot of other APIs to uh, be able to compose properly. So do you have any comments on this? Um, maybe on the style side? I will say for my part, personally, I have seen optional and what I would say is overused where uh, I believe an exception actually would have been much more efficient because okay. basically every single function call has to have a switch. Did it return a value or not? Did it return mm -hmm. a value or not? Did it return a value mm -hmm. or not? Uh, if you had just thrown an exception and caught it five levels higher up, you would have saved all kinds of branch conditions and written simpler code. Because then I, all these if else's. Yeah, I, I do have exceptions uh, enabled in my code base, but uh, what can you do if you you cannot touch exceptions? Well, then you want something like expected or an optional, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Expected Although, would be nice. <laughs> optional for error handling. I will say this with a pretty strong personal opinion. Optional should not be used for error handling because there's no way to carry an error message with it. Use a variant or an expected would be my strong personal opinion here. Well, um, in in this regard, I think other languages actually embrace optional as um, uh, maybe values. Uh, we mentioned Rust earlier. Uh, several APIs uh, like unwrap APIs or um, I don't know uh, lookup, for example, uh, um, maybe a map a hash map lookup return optional values. So. Do you consider that a form of um, error checking or do you consider that a, a normal straight path? You're saying like if you do a <clears throat> specifically something like get the, val get the value with this key from an object mm -hmm. and, and it returns optional if that value doesn't exist. Yeah. 
For yeah. example, that's this is not, what happens in Rust. Right. That's not an error. In, well, okay. Perhaps you could argue it is an error, but mm -hmm. it's an error with only one possible reason, one possible explanation. If in the code like I'm talking about, the code is a parser and it returns an optional as to whether or not the parse succeeded, mm -hmm. then you have to go and ask the parser, why did you fail? Yeah, give me the last error. <laughs> and that's, yeah. now what do we do? We're talking like error no at this point. Like this is, yeah, yeah. in my opinion, that, that definitely falls so apart. Standard expect it is, is falling into this category. So it's going to fill this hole. Uh, and uh, you do have APIs, for example, um, uh, file IO APIs in Rust uh, return a result. So that's a type that carries extra information there. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, I do... do... Yeah, go ahead. Can I make another comment about this example before we move on to another one? Go ahead. Uh, so I would started by saying I carefully crafted this example to be one that I knew would not add any overhead. Um, I want to make an, an Take a, a teaching moment, if we will. <laughs> Let's see. I have just fundamentally changed the nature of this code. The compiler still sees through it. Uh, that's largely because this is still a small string. Let's go to the heap. OK. Now, clearly, clearly different. <laughs> clearly different. Now, I'm going to return the value directly here. Uh, so these are our two different options for how we're looking at this code. Just as a hand wavy, okay, this is 59 instructions that have been returned. If I go back to this version, how many instructions was it? Did we? Did anyone look? 59 instructions in the compilation. I didn't look. It is 86. Why? What's the difference? This is one of my pet peeves with optional. So I wanted to give the yes, it can work just fine, but there's a gotcha. You got me. What's the ah. gotcha here? Uh, I'm looking at the chat window also. Uh, Let me see. I, I don't see anything. Yeah, people are saying RVO. Nope, it's not RVO. No, I, I thought about that, but hmm. it's not RVO or in RVO. What is the return type of this function? Optional of string. What am I returning from this function? Uh, so uh, I think uh, Bjorn hinted at this. You have to uh, copy construct a string. I'm copy constructing the string, yeah. So the yeah. return type of this function is an optional of string, but yeah. the a value that I'm returning is a string. Mm -hmm. So here, I am doing a copy construct. Yeah, we have a winner. It was Bjorn who pointed that in the chat. <laughs> this is the, if you had code that needed to be written like this, this is actually the, uh, the quote, more efficient thing to do. Why is it not compiling? Why isn't it compiling? That should compile. Redundant. Haha. <laughs> it says redundant move and return statement. You're yeah. wrong, GCC. That is not a redundant move. It uh, is only implicitly a move in the case where the types match. I think uh, Clang, I think we, maybe it would be instructive to, to switch to Clang. I think Clang emits the same warning. Clang, I believe, is correct when it emits the same warning. <laughs> GC. Uh, so, so you're saying Clang makes the distinction distinction between the two uh, scenarios here? There is a very definite distinction between these two scenarios. Yes. Yeah, oh. Clang is correct oh. Oh. Uh, because the types differ. The return, the type that I'm mm -hmm. returning, and the type that is the return type from the function differs. So it mm -hmm. has to do something with this. It has to create, uh, or it has to create a new temporary optional string on the stack. 
from whatever the return value was. So in this case, it's not a pessimization to move uh, out of the function. Correct. So most it, most of the time, that's over. Uh, that's a that's a pessimization, and people are accustomed to seeing this uh, <laughs> idiom. And see, when I corrected the actual type here by making this an optional string because that matches the return type, now Clang actually gets the correct warning here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because the, now the types match correctly. Yep. So uh, this is my personal pet peeve with optional is that it has an implicit converting constructor from the contained type Mm -hmm. to itself, which means you're going to get potentially accidental copies throughout your code if you're not paying attention. You need to know what your types are and have them match. And there is no compiler warning you can enable to tell you, let me know when an implicitly invoked optional single parameter constructor was called. That warning doesn't exist. That static analysis doesn't exist. Yeah, unfortunate. No. Yeah. That's a, could be a room for a, maybe a clank tidy check. Yeah. Um, and if we're on the subject, uh, where do you stand on uh, implicitly unwrapping optionals uh, as a as an idea? Uh, do you see, do you, uh, are you a fan of being explicit about unwrapping optionals, or do you prefer the? Would you prefer like an, an automatic unwrapping? Uh, let's saying like let's add. Uh, let's talk uh, hypothetically here. Like, uh, if you had to design this little library facility, and uh, if you can leverage like compiler support for something like this, would you prefer like um, automatic unwrapping for a more natural look, so that the code, or do you consider, or do you consider this like uh, a pitfall that like people could be uh, misjudging a situation? Uh, uh, if if it, it if the grammar is too 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 simple too too straightforward. So you're saying maybe something like this: if mm -hmm. I tried to assign it to a string mm -hmm. from an optional string, now I would not be in favor of that because I am in I am personally not in favor of pretty much any implicit conversion. And you're talking about another implicit conversion there. Mm -hmm. Bam! That's a copy. <laughs> it has to be a copy. Yeah. And if you made that implicit and and automatic, then it's just that many more copies that we're doing in our code. OK, so you, you prefer being explicit about it so you can actually pinpoint where uh, the option is actually extracted then. Yeah, I mean, because of because of this problem. Now, if if mm -hmm. the language somehow had some other guarantee, or if we're talking like if you wanted to keep comparing it to Rust, Rusts would just move the lifetime of the ownership of this thing out, right? We can't do that in C plus plus. Yeah, yeah. Today. Um, because of the nature that this would have to be a copy, or perhaps worse, an implicit move. That would be weird. That would be weird. Why would this be an implicit move? Oh, I'm just thinking of the different ways that it could be implemented. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then that that's my problem with it. If it actually, if this was a way of transferring ownership in a way that was tracked by the compiler like Rust does, then I, yeah, fine, do what you want to do. Cool. Well, uh, I'm satisfied, and I don't think I see follow-up questions on this. Um, uh, on, I think I would uh, tag on this uh, standard move uh, that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I've seen patterns, uh, a particular pattern, um, a few times, and it definitely uh, raised some eyebrows uh, with some of uh, uh, my colleagues uh, my in code. Right in... Sorry? Am I done with this example? Sorry. Um... No, I, yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I think you can uh, scrape it. It's, all right, go ahead. It's it's not optional related. So, um, so I, I've seen um, many times the, the confusion uh, that uh, standard move uh, people. Some people think it actually moves stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I've seen um, people being uh, panicked around a particular pattern, like uh, invoking a function and moving in the function. Uh, on two uh, on two arguments, moving the same value into that function. 
for like a, a funk of a move of s comma move of s something like that we can complicate it a bit more but i think we can start there and now uh, what is the signature of this function or does it matter for the sake of this um, let's say let's say the function uh, takes uh, two strings two standard strings uh, by reference uh, I would be, I would be tempted to to take them by value, but we can right. we can start we can start uh, uh, another discussion there. Maybe maybe we we can preempt that and talk about uh, sync arguments because I've I've heard um, many comments around that too. Mm -hmm. uh, the the myth of um, maybe we should start with that one first because you already have it there and it's a good starting point. Um, I've heard it. I've heard this many times. Uh, we all know from uh, uh, old time C plus plus that you should pass uh, all parameters by constant reference uh, to avoid copying. And um, since we have uh, move semantics, uh, a new pattern uh, uh, has emerged of uh, syncing arguments into positions. For example, if we're thinking about constructors or setters, uh, if we we plan to store that value. This is what we, we have. We, we have take a copy or take ownership of the value or something. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's what uh, what I mean by sync. I think Sean Parent coined the the terminology for this pattern. I don't know. Uh, the f I think uh, I've heard that that the first time uh, from him. Uh, so uh, we have the pattern of passing by value and moving it into the destination, like a like a member. And maybe we can chat a bit about this pattern and see. Um, if we have situations where it's a, it's an anti-pattern. So I just tend to like using string for these things because it's a simple but yet complex type, and it gives us a lot mm -hmm. to talk about. Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. We we don't need to go generic. <laughs> uh, I already see people in chat being intrigued, but but why uh, about what double move does? <laughs> so uh, we're gonna we're gonna get there. Uh, but first, let's uh, let's settle this uh, uh, sync argument uh, idiom. Yeah, settle it. I'm sure we'll settle it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, oh, by the way, um, someone asked earlier, <clears throat> why was a uh, why was that move an actual build error? Yes, I do have dash w error set. I have lots of warnings enabled in my particular compiler explorer instance here, and I have them uh, dash w error. Maybe we should mention that uh, people should strive for uh, W all, uh, W extra, W pedantic, W error. That the uh, absolute minimum. Those five are th those would be the minimum. And you're yeah. if you're uh, did I mention pedantic? Also yeah. W pedantic, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you're really pedantic, maybe add W shadow. <laughs> and if you're doubly pedantic do know that the flag used to be dash pedantic, but it has actually been updated to W pedantic. So <laughs> <laughs> That's meta pedantic there. <laughs> OK. So do, do strive for the highest warning levels and do treat your warnings as errors, people. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to go, uh, where we want to go with this particular example here, but um, I, I've created an object and I have a syncing function. This is, this is what you mean by a syncing function. We know that we're going to do something mm -hmm. ownership wise with this value or whatever. So our option is to take it by copy. Or by const reference, like the old timers did. Or by const reference. Um, OK, so this, I will say, like right now, this is generally the recommended mechanism, right? This is a, there's a Clang modernized check that will do this for you. I know, and I've used that modernize, and, I, uh, and I've heard people complain about this pattern. <laughs> so the, da, da, da. I'm going to bust out. all of the possibilities here. So uh, if you want to do this efficiently, you have effectively two options. 
and it it starts to get combinatorical if we have more than one parameter. <laughs> yes, that is the problem. So that's the, got, <laughs> yeah. that's the main problem. So if we've got one parameter, no big deal. If we've got two parameters, we've got four functions. If we've got three parameters, we have yeah. eight functions, right? Yeah. So that's why this is the generally recommended option. Now, this version, now you can see the compilers just made all of this just go away, right? And I'm in Clang, and Clang's heap elision is going to start to get in our way. And when we try to write examples like this, so I'm doing one that's explicitly allocating on the heap. Ooh. Clang didn't optimize that away. I am actually surprised. Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. We actually hmm. we actually had a comment earlier asking about uh, what does heap elision do. We had a comment in chat, and uh, follow up was um, does uh, heap elision only works in Clang or does it work in GCC too? Uh, that's a bit of well. That, let's just. I'm going to give the like really short answer. I just create an int. That should be a heap allocation. The compiler removed this heap allocation for me. And, and one view of this code, this is a memory leak. And another view of the code, the compiler goes, yeah, yeah, whatever. You didn't use that memory anyhow. Yeah. But this is a fairly trivial case. It, it, it can handle much more complicated situations it as well. can, but it also tends to not be. So uh, GCC, by the way, does now also support heap elision. Oh, let's see, plus 20 mode. Um, but only in the more much more recent compiler. So you can see here that Clang is doing the new. What in the world? That is not. What's going on in there? It's Clang, it's GCC, excuse me, not optimizing away the standard string. And S is what's going on. That is weird. OK, so if I, I comment out that creation of this object, this is the, the heap allocation here. And in modern, uh, more recent versions of GCC and basically every version of Clang, it can say, oh, you're not using this heap allocated object. Or you did use it, but in a way that I can perfectly track. And then it just removes it. That's heap elision in a nutshell. Yeah. I do have an episode. We may as well reference people to that. That is. I think it's worth mentioning that uh, this optimization is in Clang like forever. Like I think it's from version three or something. It's yeah, basically forever. Yeah, basically forever. You can basically uh, count on it if you're in Clang. If you're yeah. on GCC, you have to check your version. Now, what gets me like really weirded out? Uh, and just for the record, this is pretty much how my classes go. Also, if you were to attend one of the classes that I teach, um, is we get a conversation and then I just we we do we explore it until it makes sense to everyone. I just allocated a thousand integers on the heap, and the compiler said, "Yeah, whatever, you're it's fine." I'm not. I it kind of bothers me in a way <laughs> that it's covering up my my memory leak. Uh, we do we do have a comment here about uh, what if uh, it's not a trivial type and it has a constructor with side effects. What happens then? Uh, that's what we'll see. Uh, we had this comment in chat earlier. Okay, you're talking about heap heap elision. Okay, mm -hmm. heap elision if the constructor has side effects. That's so we're talking about something like a long string, right? So a long string is is going to do a heap allocation and it has a destructor with side effects and it's going to create mm -hmm. something on each loop here. Now GCC um, is is just going to create a thousand strings for me. It's just going through this loop. I think last time I checked Clang. Uh, no, Clang's the same. See. There's some like limit. It's like you know one of these talks. Uh, nope. Hmm. Well, you know, it's up to the compiler. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, uh, okay, I can look at this a different way.
I just got my loop unrolled. Uh, yeah, you know, I've seen it in some cases remove even more complicated things when it can, but yeah, it's not at the moment. Clang doesn't feel like it today. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we, have, we, we haven't hit a, a good example there. Yeah. All right. So let's and get back to your syncing. Getting back to syncs. Yeah. So in this particular case, I've got this long string. Now I am creating this long string at the invocation of the function call. It's kind of like there's an outer scope set up. It had to build the stack that's being passed to this function call. So it had to create this string, this thing new value, and it is directly initializing that uh, with this value. So it's going to be an efficient constructor call into the string. And then we're going to do a move of that into the local value, move assignment of that into a local value. So um, it's probably going to be efficient, possibly allied this move operation here. Um, if I were to have, something like this, and I pass it in here, then I get a copy because I have this local value on the stack and I am explicitly telling the compiler, please make a copy of it before you call this function. That's what pass by copy default semantics are gonna do here. And then it's gonna cast this thing to an R value reference and perform a move uh, assignment operation on it here. So we get a copy and then a move. The first one, maybe one move. The second one, a copy and then a move. And if I did this, then I'm gonna get a move and then a move. So at the best case scenario, I have at least one move in the situation. Now, if we go to this version, but it has that combinatorial problem that you referred to, and I pass it by copy here, it's going to match against the const L value reference version of the function yep. and then do a simple copy assignment. So that's exactly one copy, not a copy and then a move. So that's where people would argue that, okay, mm -hmm. well, this is the more efficient thing to do. Technically they're yeah. correct. It's the more efficient thing to do. Um, and also the situation where you have like um, a string literal or something like that. Uh, yes. So in the situation where there's a string literal, then it defaults to being exactly the same as this invocation because it has to still create a temporary string object somewhere. It's mm -hmm. going to create an R value reference of it, and then it will do a move. Again, something that might be alighted. I'm not sure if the rules say that there's any guarantee of a move illusion there. Yeah, someone's asking if one move can be alighted. We'd have to dig much deeper into this. Um, yeah. To see. Does that answer your comment? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Okay. So uh, I, I'm definitely in the camp uh, of uh, using sync arguments uh, by value. So I, I've been using this uh, for a while since I basically found out about this pattern mm -hmm. a few years back. And, but I still see people being freaked out because they have this uh, like uh, muscle memory of <laughs> always passing by const reference. So <laughs> I, I do understand their concern and I, I think they, they need to be uh, to convince themselves that uh, it, it works better in most situations. Okay, I'm just gonna like, just go right off the, the, the rails here. What do you think of this version on line 41 instead? It definitely freaks me out, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, it, 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 I think I think you did, did didn't you do a video uh, an episode on this? Probably. It, it looks familiar. It looks familiar. This. I, I, all I'm doing is just doing direct assignment of the thing, right? Do yeah, I yeah. need a setter? I don't know. It, it. I. I think it's. There's a deeper issue here uh, aside from performance. Um, people are not comfortable with uh, exposing um, uh, private uh, private members of uh, of functions. So in this case, you have like a plain struct. I think. Uh, S. I do. I do have a regular uh, struct. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I think I think the deeper question here would be if you, if we need to guarantee some kind of invariant around uh, the stored value, and if we want to expose this as a direct uh, a, a direct uh, accessible member. Yeah, so this is a terrible, terrible example. Yeah, it's um, but, it's it's fairly artificial. <laughs> yes. If if I had this. If I had something that was directly tied to the other mm -hmm. value in the struct, so you need to preserve an, in, an invariant there. Pre preserve an invariant, then I totally agree. We need our setters. But I find myself personally more and more going, you know what? This is just a collection of data that I have in a struct for convenience purposes. And there aren't invariants maintained between the things. Of course, there often are, but not always. So I just want to throw that out there. If I'm teaching a class at this point, just for the record, for those of you on the stream and those of you who watch this later, later, excuse me, if I were teaching a class at this moment, I would say, do not go back to your coworkers and say that Jason said to make everything public. <laughs> I just want you to think about the design decisions you're making. Are the so, setters yeah. necessary? Yeah, it, it it very much depends on the semantic of your object and what you're trying to encapsulate there. There's a yeah. uh, there's another option here. <clears throat> should I go in C plus plus twenty mode or should I go in C plus plus seventeen mode? Uh, what I just take any one. No. I don't think it matters. Uh actually oh no wait, it does matter. <laughs> uh what are you trying to do? Um, uh, I'm going to do a forwarding reference. Uh, OK. I'm still in the camp of calling it the Scott Myers way, uh, universal reference. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the reason Scott was overruled is because it can't actually refer to anything. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's much uh, pleasant on the... <laughs> Well, uh, much more pleasant to, to say that way. <laughs> I don't know. I like I, the reference because I like that it is implying that it is meant for the situation where you're supposed to use standard forward. Yeah, yeah. It, it tells the intent, right, right. right. OK, so, so in this case, um, maybe it's because I, 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 I learned about this kind of stuff from uh, Scott's book. I don't know. Maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did too. I read. I think the copy of it that I bought was pre-publication. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just a, just another possibility here. Uh, it, this doesn't work in an inheritance hierarchy because you can't um, you can't make templated functions virtual, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is another option. It's way more verbose. What a pain in the rear. But. Uh, what if I pass a character string literal into this, or if I pass a standard string, or if I pass anything convertible to a standard string, then this will actually do the most efficient option in every case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is just something else to, to be aware of. Um, depending on your level of C++ knowledge, don't go sprinkling forwarding references and templates around just for the fun of it and your setters. I would personally rather that you just make all of your data members public. <laughs> but but uh, they should, shouldn't should quote you on that. <laughs> uh, don't quote me on that. No. Uh, we have a, a related question here. Uh, what about the situation where when you may sync the value depending on something else? Oh. Can, can we explore this like a conditional sync? A conditional sync. OK. So yeah. Something that's not straightforward, like the this example. Right. So you're saying, I'm, well, building from what I have at, at the moment here, this is interesting. Um, this also comes for Bjorn, from Bjorn. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Bjorn. Uh, <laughs> so let's see if the current string is smaller than the new string. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Then I want to take the new string else. Well, else I don't want to do anything.
Is that a decent example? It's simple enough to illustrate the point. Okay. Um, why isn't it compiled? Oh, undefined. Uh, You pretty much have to do a forwarding reference in this case, don't you? I mean, if you care about the efficiency of it. Otherwise, you have to implement the same exact function twice. And it's no longer a trivial function to implement. It's no longer just an assignment operation. Yeah, you have to duplicate the logic with the decision there, yeah. Is, is Bjorn trying to lead us to the, uh, the deducing this? Oh, no, deducing this wouldn't actually help in this case. <laughs> I don't know if, if he's satisfied with this example. Maybe uh, maybe he should uh, go. Uh, maybe he should come in with a follow up or something. But I I do think uh, in this kind of situation, I don't think you can get away with uh, the the two overloads. Oh, like we did before. A comment here saying that this would no longer work with string literals, which is true. Hmm. This might be a situation where if you really cared about all of the things, you would have to uh, you would have to implement two versions. I'm gonna try implementing two versions and I'll get the 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 approval or whatever of the uh, of the peanut gallery here on this. I will say to Bjorn's credit that this is the uh, first time I've ever gotten a question like this. So I don't have any kind of ready set opinion or answer here. Um, uh, Bjorn came back with the follow up. Uh, he liked the example, but he's just um, thinking about uh, what if you don't want to use a template. So maybe you're yeah. on the right track here. Maybe I'm on the right track, but I mean, string, we have a special helper here in the standard library called string view. And so now if I pass in something. I, 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 nah, you're cheating now because you're taking on a specific uh, type. <laughs> well, I mean, is, is the nature of this not going to be specific to specific types? I don't know. I mean. If this were unique pointer instead, and I might take ownership of the unique pointer, that's the okay. maybe ownership pattern where you take a unique pointer by ref non-const reference, then you... Well, people usually pass unique pointers by value, so... Yeah. Uh... Well, yeah, but if you had a situation where you might take ownership of the unique pointer, then you want to actually pass it by our value reference. Sure, yeah. sure. And but then you wouldn't have multiple overloads. So, okay, this is my argument. The reason this particular example is special is because it is a string. Because it was our viewer who commented that the string literal that it takes yeah. the, the string literal problem. So this, mm -hmm. I believe, is a solution that works in either case. Huh. But uh, couldn't we, we do just one overload, just the one with the string view? And um, oh, then they we always have to copy the data. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And I just noticed that if yeah, you look here, right. this line is highlighted and this line is not highlighted. So uh, I have to do a move and then we should see the highlight. Move up to this line. Yay, we did. In fact, okay, that's a, it's interesting possibility. Do I use Linux or Windows? Yes, every day, both, all the time. Actually, I have both running all the time. Uh, standard size without the use of a template. Uh, standard size would still need two template functions because standard size can only work on a array. And a standard temp, a regular template is going to decay the string literal into a pointer, right? And so I, you have yeah. to use the special syntax for capturing a reference to an array. So we would still need two versions. 
one that takes a forwarding reference or an R value reference or something, and the other one that takes a reference to an array, templated reference to an array. Uh, yeah, okay. So, what is, was there a myth here? Uh, I, I the myth was around: uh, is this uh, a good option to use uh, pass by value for sync arguments and maybe settle this once in for all and for all? Uh, I don't know if we if we got there. Did we settle it? Um, it depends. <laughs> I would say it depends. <laughs> there are situations if you really care about uh, every single uh, copy and uh, uh, assignment that happens there, there, there might be situations where if it's not a problem of combinatorics, you might get down to actually being explicit and having overloads. I don't know. Yeah, no. I So we didn't actually measure anything with like quick bench or anything here. And it, honestly, it would be hard to do um, because... Yeah. String copies, if you're doing billions of them, they add up. If you're if you're not, that I mean, they're not really that expensive, uh, as uh, much as we want to try to avoid them. Generally, I, how I tend to go about this kind of thing is I usually use an instrumented object, like a uh, uh, made up object that has uh, tracks all the constructions, assignments, destructions, everything, and I just print out the, everything that happens, and I just count the operations there. But yeah, you do have to benchmark to see if it really matters. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what it is. You should default, in, like in every case that you can, default to the best practice. Mm -hmm. I think it's with the Clang modernized check, and if you can take the sum combination of all the CVPCon talks and whatever, taking the value, taking it by value and doing a move, following that pattern is the commonly accepted best practice, and then benchmark it and find out, is this actually a problem in your code? It's unlikely that it is. But if it is a problem, you have an easy solution. Just split it into two functions. Yeah. Unless you have like a gazillion arguments. Uh, well, yeah. and, and, and in that case, maybe you should rethink your design <laughs> of the <that> API. <laughs> or, or use a, a template that takes, you know, five forwarding references or something like that. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe we should now uh, circle back to where I started. Um, regarding uh, the double move that I mentioned earlier. Yes. So, so let's say we have a function that, have takes, that takes two strings, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it does something with it. Maybe they, it, it concatenates or prints them, uh, doesn't matter. And uh, we have uh, uh, an external value that we move into this function as both um, first and second argument. Oh, goodness. Did uh, you understand what uh, what I was trying oh, to say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I've actually seen code that code like this. I I am not making this up. So um, now now let's do let's. I'm gonna go back to the print strings. Okay, and, uh, and the scenario would be to call print strings. Yeah, with the same the same literal. Or not literal, excuse me, same identifier passed to both. Exactly. Move of S and comma move of S. Yeah. I want to know what the person who you saw originally do this uh, was attempting to do, would be my question. I get rid of this. <laughs> People are anxious to see what what it happens. <laughs> I'm afraid that at the moment you won't see anything terribly interesting, but I'll explain why. Um, Let's create a string here. Or yeah. Something. What should it should it be a long string or a short string? Long string. I don't know. Long string. Uh, all right, so first I'm going to call them just plain and make sure this thing is compiling and printing the output. I'll put, okay. run, a, run a compiled output here. All right, hello from a long string, hello from a long string. We're not surprised, right? We just yep. called it the same thing twice. 
Now, if I do move on one of them, hello from a long string, hello from a long string, nothing changed. I do move again. Hello from a long string, hello from a long string. Still, nothing changes. And this is what freaks people out. <laughs> okay. Because the primary thing that you have to be aware of. The, the misconception is that uh, the moving out part happens when you actually see the, the, the function you use, the STD move there. <laughs> so right. so let's, just, let's just do this real quick. I think the naming is uh, unfortunate. Maybe th this function should not be called uh, move. <laughs> Maybe so, it was uh, the the wrong name for it. Right. Yeah, I don't it's what is it? It's it's actual name should be cast to our value reference and see what happens next. <laughs> that would be accurate actually. <laughs> uh, so this example's gotten too long. Um too long of a line. This thing, I just called it moved to. This, this is not, a move occurs when a new object is constructed. Excuse me. A move might occur when a new object is constructed. This thing, this const reference to a string, there's no new object being constructed here. This is a standard string. I have cast it to string our value reference, which is implicitly convertible to a const L value string reference. There's no object here. This is just references all the way down. So this didn't, I saw a comment in the, in the chat that this is copy. It's not a copy either. It's just a reference. It's still just a reference. Uh, Jason, uh, let me stop you right there for a bit. I think this is a perfect showcase uh, to actually show people uh, CPP insights and maybe see what it happens behind the scenes. So if you press this magic button, CPP Insights, it'll pop it up in a new tab right here, and we can explore yeah. the code further. Exactly. Uh, let me intro this tool a bit. Uh, it, uh, CPP Insights uh, is done by our friend um, Andreas Fertig, and it basically shows you what the compiler sees. <laughs> it, it doesn't show you the, the AST and uh, all the, the guts uh, inside it, but uh, you can actually see uh, uh, higher level constructs basically deconstructed and see them as a lower level um, entities. So you can see an equivalent code. Uh, as, as it's a very useful tool for teaching. It's a very useful tool for understanding um, uh, type inference, for example, um, for ex uh, understanding um, overload sets and uh, template instantiations uh, understanding new constructs in the language, for example, if you want to understand how range for loop works, or if you understand want to understand how structured bindings work, it's it's a very handy tool to actually make sense of what happens behind the scenes. And uh, if you're trying to deduce uh, or see situations where like uh, reference collapsing or uh, uh, auto usage and what it infers behind the scenes, uh, it's a very handy tool. So maybe we can uh, see. Uh, what happens here? Yeah, I'm afraid it's not actually giving us any <laughs> insight at the moment. I don't know if Andreas is watching. Um, oh, but whoops. It's, the code's exactly the same, pretty much. Whoops. Uh, whoops. <laughs> yeah. It expanded these template aliases. So that's a little just insight there that std string is actually a, an alias to a basic string of car. Um, uh, so let's take one of these. Let's actually modify this in such a way that it is now actually taking a copy, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Oh, all right. That this actually is interesting. Did I don't know if our viewers saw the change there. Uh, so I took the first parameter. So it, it is was, no longer, it was kind of subtle. <laughs> very subtle. It's no longer a reference. The second one is still a reference. And now we can see in CVP Insights that we have the implicit construction of a new string happening on the function call. And that is actually what we were kind of looking to see here. So if I take this back and add this reference back into it, then this implicit construction of this temporary string goes away. 
So the move is saying, okay, no, you are actually, or we're seeing we actually are creating a new object with a move in that case, in the case that it's not a reference. So I'm gonna go back to this. And if we take the reference off of both of these, and now I just said a move can't occur unless a new object is being constructed. We're getting a new object constructed here. And now we see fun Whoops. times. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first string got hello from a long string. The second string is now empty because we moved that value out into the first parameter, which is no longer a reference now. And then when we passed that same identifier to the second parameter, it's now empty. We stole its contents. Its contents now lives here in this temporary that's used for this first parameter. Uh, maybe you, sh you should comment out line 17 to avoid confusion there. Uh, yeah, so I'll just read Because it. it's not used. Yeah. yeah. Line 17 isn't, isn't doing anything meaningful here. Yeah. Now. What a, and I, uh, I come up with a follow-up question. But Jason, what happens if this is a short string? <laughs> uh, then it, the object is left, Victor, in a valid but unspecified state. <laughs> <laughs> That's even more interesting, I would say. <laughs> uh, I will tell you that every standard library implementation still zeroes out the short string. But it's UB, so yeah. It's not UB. It's, it's not? Specified. Oh, so it's, it's unspecified. OK. Yes. Okay. No, nothing here is undefined behavior. It's just bad code. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and in and, and the topic of unspecified, you notice that the first parameter is the one that's getting ownership of the new string. That uh, it, de it depends on the order of evaluation. So yeah. depends on the order of evaluation of function arguments. We happen to be using Clang, which evaluates strictly left to right. Mm -hmm. If I switch this over to GCC, then I expect, yep. Yep. Confirmed. GCC evaluates <laughs> right to left. Yeah. And maybe we should mention, because I've, I've heard people being confused about this, uh, uh, C++ 17 actually requires a consistent order of, of evaluation, but it's not specified which order should it should be in. So it just yeah. has to be consistent everywhere in the same and compiler. It can't be interleaved. You can't do yeah. part yeah. of the first yeah. parameter or part of the second yeah. parameter. Yeah. You have to do all of a parameter, all of the first one, yeah. all of the second one. So, or... uh, some people are confused by, because they assume it must be consistent across compilers. It must be consistent within oh. the same compiler. So. Yeah. And GCC still is just full of bugs when it comes to, to order of evaluation of function arguments in the C17 rules. I actually okay. should have covered that in my features from C17 you still can't use in 2021 video. Yeah. So, I... yeah. Don't do this. This code, this code is cursed. Yes, yeah, someone said this code is cursed. It is, it is cursed. So it, uh, this kind of thing, it will not pass code review, right? Uh, not from me. OK. OK. <laughs> OK, so someone said, uh, please evaluate further, or please elaborate further on the order of evaluation of uh, uh, function arguments. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right here. Perfect. Now. What C++, before C++17, it would be possible that this code, this summation, were evaluated, and then this summation were evaluated, and then the move here were evaluated, and then this move were evaluated. It was possible technically pre-C++17 that these things could be evaluated basically in any order at all. C17 and later says that a the order of evaluation of function arguments is evaluated in an uns oh what is it fully evaluated sync oh dad gum it's been too long since I've taught that class. Anyhow, fully evaluated in an unspecified order, basically. So it must evaluate the entire parameter and then evaluate the entire parameter. But there's no guarantee that if I had the same, uh, if I this function had three parameters to it, it won't compile now because of my function only takes two parameters. It could compile the second one and then, or excuse me, evaluate the second one, then evaluate the first one, then evaluate the third one. 
or it could evaluate the third one, then the first one, then the second one, or first, second, third, or third, whatever, right? It can evaluate them in any order it wants to, but it must evaluate the entire function argument and instantiate where it's going to live. So instantiate this thing before it moves on to the next function argument. That's what C17 says. Uh, I think uh, uh, if people remember, uh, I just uh, had a, a flashback uh, now. Um, uh, Herb Sutter actually had a, a Guru of the Week item uh, with something similar, uh, talking about exception safe functions. Guru of the Week uh, 102, uh, which is an updated version of Guru of the Week uh, numbers 56. And uh, uh, basically, um, he had an example with a function taking uh, two pointers and constructing those um, uh, temporary objects uh, with new and with uh, un uh, make unique or unique uh, pointer. Right. Yeah, that's so, the uh, examples that make unique, yeah. Exactly. So uh, this is a canonical, uh, canonical example if you're thinking about uh, order of evaluation and constructing the, the temporary object and wrapping it in the unique pointer uh, before passing it out to the function to avoid the, any leak in case of uh, an exception happening when constructing the objects. Right. Uh, I That particular example from Herb, and it's also in Scott Myers's Effective Modern C++ book, and it's also in the standard. Oh, really? me. Yes. I didn't know. It bothers me because um, I tried on every compiler at the day, at the time, and could not get a single compiler that actually created a memory leak in that case. <laughs> <laughs> no, no compiler actually did this theoretical interleaving of evaluation of function arguments. And so I'm like, I don't get the point of this example. And I stormed out of my, I don't know, stormed out of some <laughs> um, But that is the, 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 the official example. Um, <laughs> I, uh, there's other comments here. Someone said that in uh, GCC and const expert code will evaluate left to right. That might be true, but it's also important to remember uh, that, how do, how do I, how do I want to demonstrate this? Uh, well, we, we, we get all the, all the right defaults in const expert context, so. <laughs> What are you trying to? Oh, I'm doing something here. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Okay. That is, that is weird. Okay. So this is GCC, which we already said evaluates right to left, right? So we would expect that it would have gotten the size and then it would have moved the string in. But instead, it appears to have moved the string in and now gotten a size that is zero, which is why I am getting an empty string here. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's messed up. <laughs> that is because inside of braced initialization, it is, aha, GCC. Uh, OK, yeah. So inside of braced initialization, it is guaranteed that the compiler evaluates strictly left to right. So GCC seems to be in any constructor at the moment evaluating left to right. Yeah, that's what GCC, it's totally, it's evaluating left to right just because it's a constructor call. I am. So if you're saying if we replace this with curlies, it, it changes the behavior? Um, I'm saying it would have at one time. I'm going back in time in GCC's compiler now. Compiler Explorer as a time traveling machine. Uh, well, anyhow, in braced initialization, the compiler is required to evaluate left to right. That that was the uh, that was the point of my. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, that is why, so uh, 
I'm sorry. Now, now I'm on a mission, and I, I don't <laughs> want to take up the rest of our time here on this little mission. But um, I might be forced to. Um, I'm having to get rid of lib format because I went far back in time. I'm going to end up regretting going down this road, aren't I? <laughs> okay. Well, you went this rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, this is one of these things, isn't it? It is. Uh, shoot. I just recorded an episode on this. In this particular constructor to standard string, it is taking a string object followed by the number of characters to take from that string object. So, oh yeah, yeah, right, right. Or no, is it the number of characters to skip? It's the number of characters to skip. That's what it's doing. Okay, let's go back in time again. Or let's go forward in time. Change compilers. I'm going to regret this. I know I am. Sorry, everyone, for the distraction here, but hopefully we'll make a point in just a moment. Moving a temporary, yeah, yeah, that's definitely pointless to move the result of a temporary. Thank you, Clang, for the proper warning here. Uh, but Jesus, so Clang always evaluates left to right. And GCC uh, generally only does it when it has to. So I'm having a bad time coming up with a good example. I apologize. So we'll just move on from here. Yeah. <clears throat> but if it's braced in net, the compiler is supposed to always do it left to right. That is required in the standard. Braced in net is always left to right. That is where GCC has its remaining bugs. I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. Well. I will stop. <laughs> All right, where are we? Before, before you regret it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's too late. I already regret it. <laughs> All right. Um, <sighs> All right. Yes. What happened? Should we move on to Victor, Maestro. <laughs> Did you see the comment, by the way, saying that you look like you're Tarantino's long lost brother? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I didn't think it sounded what? terribly insulting. So I thought I would. What? Well, I, I like uh, Quentin, so I, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> Somebody said I look like a vampire, so that's there's that. <laughs> no, that's that, that's just the Romanian accent. Uh... Yeah, I, uh, and I'm not from Transylvania, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. I remember the I'm, first time I went to Romania, I drove past a sign for Transylvania, and I was like, wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Uh, almost every person that that meets me asks if i'm from transylvania so no i'm i'm from a different part of romania <laughs> yeah, there's more than one what are they states counties how's that referred to in your what's the um yeah, there are regions there are 40 counties okay. and transylvania is a the whole it's a whole region oh so it's multiple counties in transylvania yeah yeah multiple okay. counties Okay, so um, I thought about um, maybe mo next moving on um, uh, another thing that I've seen uh, around. You already started uh, uh, approaching this a, a little bit about uh, uniform in initialization and maybe talk about uh, uh, some of the gotchas there and uh, I think we've all seen like uh, mean comments and, <laughs> and surprises around the uh, uh, curly brace in, in it and uh, overloads and um, the pitfalls uh, in C++ 11 that some of them have been fixed in later revisions of the standard around uh, initializer list. Uh, um, auto. Auto, yeah and maybe examine some situations and see uh, what would be the preferred way to actually initialize stuff, uh, the so-called uh, unicorn initialization in C++. Um, 
I think I think uh, uh, Timur has a, a, a viral uh, uh, meme about <laughs> about this with the uh, Forrest Gump scene. Yeah. Oh yeah, that one's awesome. Yeah, I love I, that one. It it cracks me up every time I see it. <laughs> Uh, there's a comment by so, by the way, um, someone here saying I'm never actually doing a move here at all because this constructor for string takes only a const reference. There isn't a version of it that takes an R value reference. I don't know if that's accurate or not because there's 19 overloads to the constructor for string. But let's just say that if you've been watching the last 15 minutes of me fumbling around trying to come up with a good example for this, then you can just ignore the last 15 minutes as we move on to the next thing. But yes, there are far too many constructors for string. Um, yeah. So we want. Let's talk about. Yeah, yeah. Uh... <laughs> I, do, is this. Um, it is hilarious. Yeah. Does it make sense to actually, you know, watch this as a, I don't know. Um, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and leave that play for a moment. Yeah, it cracks me up. This is from uh, Timur Dummler. Yeah, and and this scene from Forrest Gump is so classic yeah. too. It's yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's basically, I think, all true, right? Like, there's no. Yeah, I. Fairly accurate, <laughs> fairly accurate situation there. Just go ahead and extract this uh, straight from the standard, the initialization order fiasco. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, yeah, that that was that was worth it, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, so maybe maybe you can uh, show a few examples and maybe mention how things have uh, evolved from evolved from C plus plus eleven to fourteen to seventeen because. There, there, there have been several fixes around the uniforming initialization there. Uh, well, to be fair, I only know of one. So if you can point out the others, that would be awesome. But let's start. Let's start with some examples then. This one. Uh, is going to give me an unused variable because pre C plus plus seventeen. This was an initializer list of exactly one element, one integer of the value five. Post C plus plus seventeen, this became five, which should be what people expect. <laughs> yes, but what makes this particular fix very weird to me is that it is a retroactive fix. It depends not on which compiler flag setting you have. It depends on what compiler version you are compiling with. So it's a breaking change. It is a breaking change in the standard. Although anyone who is relying on this being an actual initializer list of int containing the value five probably deserve to have their code broken. Yeah, they deserve it. <laughs> Uh, so that's braced in it. And now what reasons we like braced in it is it doesn't like uh, things like, I mean, this is a straightforward example, but we're going to get a compile error here because we're trying to uh, do an, a, a cast basically from a double to an integer at compile time. Now, the standard, um, excuse me, with with parenthesized initialization, it doesn't care if we do this. We have the C legacy here. Oh, except I have warnings enabled, but yeah. Uh, th this is warnings that are stopping me, not the standard that's stopping me in this case. Yeah, that's dash w literal conversion there in that case. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your stance on curlies? Always curly, always curlies. I, I, <laughs> I just yes. realized. Because we've just constructed an example earlier where we actually passed uh, uh, with um, uh, parentheses and then we switched to curlies. Yes. So let's take this example. Oh, hey, I think I can illustrate the example I was trying to illustrate earlier. Hey. <laughs> Uh, 
People also mentioned in chat about the most vexing parts and the fact that uh, you can uh, avoid that with uh, curlies. Yes. Okay, so one reason that I find myself using curlies uh, in more places than not is because I do have this tendency actually in my own code to make more of my dev members public, like this. So, so no constructor, yeah. Right, so this braced initialization here just works. I get to treat it like a constructor, like you yeah. can see. Now in C++ 20, and I don't know, and I've, I've not actually... Oh, this, this potentially could lead to all kinds of fun. In C++20, <laughs> you can do braced initialization, uh, parenthesized initialization, excuse me, in the exact same situation. Clang clearly does not have that implemented. I think GCC does. All right, cool. OK, uh, so that's GCC's parenthesized initialization, or is C++20's parenthesized initialization. So that's maybe one of the changes that you're referring to, Victor? Yep. I'm not sure. OK. Yeah, that was one. Oh, we're seeing in GCC, I'm getting the exact same result here. This is, uh, uh, I'm getting the hello world comma and then a blank in both cases here. And I was just complaining about GCC doing different things depending on whether it's braced initialization or parenthesized initialization. So uh, I like braced initialization, like I said, because I made these data members public. And if we got into this, um, what am I doing? If we get back into this conversation that we were having, what, like an hour ago of what's the most efficient thing to do in this case, then I have to decide how I want to invoke my move. Going back to our sync arguments, yeah. Yeah. And what parameters do I expect here? And, you know, all kinds of questions. Um, <laughs> Compiling, compiling. OK. So uh, braced initialization still lets us call a constructor in the same way. and uh, Or I can go back to using parenthesized initialization and call the constructor in the same way again. And if I'm lucky, thank you, GCC, finally then we can see where we can actually see the difference here between how braced initialization actually requires left to right order of evaluation, but in parenthesized initialization, the GCC did it right to left like it used to. But did you yeah. notice that it actually only made that change after I added the constructor? Before I added the constructor and I was just doing direct initialization, even though the standard doesn't require that direct initialization with parentheses is strictly evaluated left to right, GCC did choose to evaluate it left to right in that case. So well, it's I, I, I'm guessing it didn't consider that a function call, maybe, and that's why. I, I, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, that's... Um, I think this is a much better example for what we, we were trying to show earlier. <laughs> it is definitely a better example for what I was trying yeah. to show earlier. But it's also an example of why I like brace initialization. Strictly left to right ordering, guaranteed by the standard, uh, direct initialization of members, doesn't allow converting, cons uh, doesn't allow um, lossy conversions. And as someone else said, it avoids the, the, the most vexing parse. The most vexing parse, right. Yeah. So what don't we like about braced initialization? Uh, yeah, let's say you have a legacy code base uh, and you have all kinds of uh, old fashioned uh, brace in it. And you start, uh, you start using uh, uniform initialization, you start using curlies everywhere. 
And uh, furthermore, there's a Clang Tidy uh, modernized check. Uh, it's called modernize use default member init that actually goes through and uh, removes your constructor calls that are trivial and they're just assigning to uh, assigning to to members and they do uh, um, in situ uh, in it like uh, variable curly value or true or um, maybe we can show an example we can even run clank tidy here in compile explorer so. oh yeah okay so well you expect clank tidy to do something with this code right here i mean uh, with that uh, no, that's. I think that's too complicated. Oh, okay. Sorry. For our structure. Yes. Maybe let's do another struct. Okay. So the check I'm uh, referring to is called modernize dash use dash default dash member dash init. <laughs> modernize. Modernize use default member init. Okay. And it hasn't. Uh, we can see an example there. No, let's do that. It's a fairly simple example. Uh, it's a very reliable uh, modernizer. Uh, it, it does auto fixes. Uh, we've actually run this modernize check all over our code base. Yeah. And it, it, it yielded pretty good results. So no, no false positives. So the check was pretty reliable. I've not actually seen this, but I like that. I, I, in theory, I like what it's doing here. Yes. I did too. Uh, the problem I <laughs> the problem I having is is that you end up the problem I having is that you end up with a, a mix of stuff that's using curlies and stuff that's using old style uh, in it with uh, parentheses. So uh, how do you reconcile reconciliate this uh, this issue in in terms of style? Oh, uh, you mean because uh, let's see if I can uh, zoom in a little bit more here, um, because. Uh, it, it left the parentheses here and used the braces here. It's exactly, yeah. And I, yeah, because because it, it cannot handle all the cases. If you have complicated constructors uh, or if you have um, non-trivial types that have uh, uh, constructors, so if you have non-pod types, uh, it doesn't touch those. So it can only handle uh, uh, simple types. And you, you end up with a mix of... Um, um, Mem data members that are uh, initialized in place within the, 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 the declaration, and you have members that are initialized in the uh, initializer list in the constructor. So, right, you you get a mix of both, and it looks weird. Uh, how do you recon reconcile that? I don't know. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a strong answer for this. But would would you run this kind of uh, tidy check on on a legacy code base? Personally, I think this is valuable because the value to me isn't necessarily the braces versus the parens. The value is removing the redundancy from your constructors and giving and, default value to these things. And especially if you have multiple constructors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. Right. If you only have one constructor, then it's mostly doesn't matter. But yeah. You know, they, these these kind of conversations go many different ways, right? You're like, oh, well, I've got this complicated class with 10 different constructors. And yeah, so I want to make sure I'm using these default values here so I don't mm -hmm. forget to initialize something exactly. in my constructor. Exactly. The, the flip side is, could you explain to me exactly why your class has 10 constructors again? Uh, we, we can go into that. Uh, I actually had an item on my list uh, to talk about the delegating constructors. And uh, another item I had on my list, but I don't have. I don't think we have the time today. No. Uh, right. uh, maybe we do a follow up on uh, delegating constructors. And another related topic is uh, function overload sets versus versus default parameter values. So. Um, uh, uh, yeah, lots to talk about all those. Yeah, things. exactly, exactly. But uh, we we can dig into those maybe some other time, and. Um, Going back to why do I have multiple constructors? Well, reasons. <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, one of the reasons is avoiding uh, default values for uh, arguments. Let's say. Oh, right, right. Yes, right. Yeah. So, in case of multiple constructors, um, actually doing uh, in-place construction for uh, trivial types is actually. Uh, uh, saver. Okay. 
I think. But you end up with a mix of syntax. So uh, stylistically, I'm not happy with <laughs> with the results. It's an, an, an interesting argument. I've never really thought personally about the stylistic approach, but I think since I do personally think we should wrap up in a few minutes here, particularly since, well, I'm getting tired. Two hours of hanging out and chatting and talking on YouTube adds up. Uh, let's talk about this example and why what the and a, a more concrete example as to what are the potential problems with braced and net versus not uh, actually no let's change this example let's let's have this one all right what am i doing when i what what is data here what is sorry data? i was reading the the chat <laughs> sorry <laughs> The question I, I want to propose, oppose to our viewers and to you and whatever, is what does data contain on line 34? 34. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's it's not an initializer list. So it's a, it's a, I'm guessing it's a vector with one element with value three <laughs> or the other way around. It's oh, a vector yeah. with three elements all being one. <laughs> I think it's a vector of three elements. All with I could I could never remember this kind of thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, people are saying it's one one one. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, I I could never remember this kind of thing. Okay, so. But it's definitely not an initializer list. <laughs> yes. I feel like we kind of just have to live with the fact that both of these things exist for me. <laughs> yeah, we, we we can never get rid of this because it's a breaking change, I know. Yeah. OK, so the program returned 1. Uh-oh, so it's actually 1 with the value 3. If I do 3, comma 3, then that should be, I guess, 3 values of the value 3, 3 ints value 3. So chat got it wrong. <laughs> Uh, no, so um, yeah, chat got it wrong. Okay, so it's, and, it's, I, it's easy to it's easy to be confused by this kind of thing. I make this a braced init, then this is calling the initializer list overload constructor for standard uh, standard vector. So it's actually creating a vector with two values, both with the value three. So I get two as return for main here. Um, so. Definitely, you. This is why, by the way, uh, this is. I, I thought of this example, Victor, because you said that it does not convert to braced initialization if they're non-trivial types, and that's where you end up with the mix of mm -hmm. initialization types in your well, after your claim modernized change. This is why it doesn't do that. It doesn't want to risk accidentally calling an initializer list overload in the case where you were expecting to do something else. Now, where this just bit me personally is in my current code base that I'm playing around with, I'm using braced init everywhere. And I ended up writing something that looked like, uh, other vector, and a new allocator. If you watch any of my PMR series, I was doing allocator aware code. And it didn't compile. And I'm like, why the heck isn't this compiling? I'm passing in the other vector for its move constructor with the new allocator. Uh, you're trying to build an initializer list with mismatched types. <laughs> build an initializer list, mismatched types. Yeah. That was like a just walk away kind of moment when I did <laughs> on there. And I lost like 10 minutes on that. And I feel like, you know, I shouldn't lose 10 minutes on something like that at this point in my C++ career, personally. Uh, yeah, but... I, I always, uh, in terms of um, specifying the size of a vector, I always go with the two-step, like, uh, resize after construction or reserve or something like that, just to make it clear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but we can't deny that if you actually needed to initialize a vector with this. This is just amazing. Yeah, it, it's it's great for uh, test units, for example. If you have like, a, I don't know, it, I think it's more frequent to need this kind of a, of a thing where you're constructing like an, an, an a test unit or a test input or something like that. Yeah. And, and as an aside, I just want to say, if you happen to have this code in your uh, library or whatever, that is a const 
vector that's initialized with these things, buy my book. <laughs> this is a very explicit example where I say this is the kind of thing that actually should probably be a const expr static standard array. Because what, what's a const vector with five values doing in here? Nothing. Yeah. It's doing yeah. it's doing a heap allocation. That's probably not elided. You're using the data in a short in a small scope. Why no? Make it a const expr array. And you also have a C plus plus weekly video on this, I think. Uh, probably it's the kind of thing I've ranted about several times. Yeah. Uh, you know, const expr vector would not be possible actually in this case. Uh, sorry, I just saw the most recent chat item here. Vector can be used during const expr evaluation, but a vector cannot escape a const expr function call. All memory that was allocated during the function, uh, during the const expr evaluation, must be freed by the time the const expr evaluation completes. So, yeah. Because you have the const expr new and delete there. Right. So we can't do const expr vector here. That's never going to work. Uh, well, never going to work in C20, that is. You have to do something that takes the vector and converts it to an array or whatever. And this is this is possible. It's weird, but it's possible. You have to call the code twice. But anyhow. All right. Uh, I feel like, you know, if we just maybe one more small thing we can chat about, otherwise I'm starting to lose my voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we should wrap it up here. What okay. do you think? Uh, I think so. I, I, I don't want to strain you too much. Uh, it's funny because it's just been so long since I've and talked. <laughs> and it's your second day of streaming. I, uh, you did a stream yesterday too. so. Yeah, but when I'm doing those um, embedded programming streams, I'm more just beating my head against the keyboard and less directly talking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's less interactive, I guess, but it's uh, it could still be taxing on you. <laughs> I'm going to just wait and see a moment if anyone posts any comments or anything like that. But otherwise, I think two hours two hours is a pretty good limit here. And then I will end the stream if we don't get some like awesome question in the next eight seconds, because there's approximately an eight-second delay, by the way. Um, Maybe but... we should uh, leave this like a, a, a non-open-ended uh, thing, like uh, we could do a follow-up with more stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if people enjoyed this kind of thing, uh, maybe comment on, on the video or on Twitter, and we can do a follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you leave a thumbs up and, a, and, and whatever else, and, and we'll see uh, what happens for sure. Yep. And just double checking some things. OK, otherwise, I think, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and shut down okay. the YouTube stream. Let's, uh, let's do a plug for uh, Jason's uh, code smell, C++ code smells book. People are asking uh, uh, where, <laughs> sorry? C++ best practices. Best practices, sorry. Yes. Uh, I, I was thinking about your code smells uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, presentation. Yeah. So people are asking, where, where can they get that book? So you can get it uh, in print. So it's uh, an Amazon print to order. And you can uh, get it on LeanPub as well. Just search for Jason Turner on LeanPub and should, you should find it. And I think I am allowed to post a URL since I am. I can post it if you want. Oh, okay. that worked. Yeah, okay. so that's my LeanPub. And the LeanPub has links to the print version too. So yeah, yeah, yeah I have it. <laughs> every, 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 Sorry? Did you buy the print version? No, I don't cut trees. I have the, <laughs> the digital version. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, yeah. I have the digital version. All right, uh, all right, cool. I'm going to hit the end stream button. Thanks, everyone, for Thank joining. Thank you, everyone, for joining. All right. See you.